try to focus on since we've been thinking about uh, the shift towards the digital environment, 10 years more, 15 years, uh, digital environment and, um, and the way in which uh, we as a society can organize uh, uh, fair uses of, uh, of, of technology and the way in which content can both uh, serve as um, uh, the, so that the, the balances of traditional copyright can be brought into the digital age. So um, first of all, I wanted to um, give a general um, uh, point of posture on, on, on the issue. I think that there's very exciting developments in, uh, as, as a matter of uh, metadata and automated, uh, automated uh, control of uses of technology. And um, I think that there's a lot of promise in it. I think that, um, I think we've all realized, especially with the uh, rise of search engines and our uses uh, of search engines, uh, the extent to which it's not just content, but the uses and the manipulation of uh, content that is valuable. Um, my, I'll share the fact that my hard drive crashed last weekend, and um, and just you know, it isn't just the stuff that's on my computer; it's finding it. Um, as Nick described, it's just a, uh, an indispensable tool that I uh, miss very much uh, today and yesterday and um, uh, this past week. But um, but uh, there are two main thoughts I'd like to uh, to impart uh, in regards to what's been said so far. Um, one is in regards to intellectual privacy, um, what the impact of the implementation of these tools will have on individuals and um, their autonomy uh, in regards to, to privacy. And secondly, about the asymmetry of the relationship between these tools, the extent to which users' um, uh, needs and, uh, and uh, uses are taken into account in addition to um, creators and rights centers. So those are the two main um, things I'd like to say. Um, and to give an example of that, there was a, there was a um, thing that comes to mind. Um, it was a TV show in the 80s, uh, 1980s, uh, Max Headroom. I don't know if anyone remembers it or knows of it. Um, but there was, uh, it was this dystopian feature of uh, where the cable companies all owned, TV cable companies, owned everything over the airwaves and Max Headroom was, I guess it would be best described as a hacker um, who kind of appeared um, uh, on the screen to give little messages. Um, there was one episode that particularly comes to mind where there was a court case um, and, uh, and, and there was a, an individual that was brought um, uh, with a claim of some crime and the way that the court case went um, differently than what we're used to is that each side presented a diskette we, we used to use floppies, if you remember. Um, and each side presented a diskette of their um, case. And it was entered into the computer, and uh, that was how uh, it was processed in order to get a judicial result. Um, unfortunately for uh, the defendant, um, he was a, in this science fiction society, he was a zero um, in this binary world. Um, and the data wasn't full, and it was corrupted, and so he lost the case by default uh, just because of um, uh, his, his, his position in society and, and, um, and the fact that, uh, that his arguments uh, were not processed um, as fully as others. So um, with that in mind, I think um, there's a possibility as we implement an infrastructure on a technological side um, of uh, forgetting one side of the equation. And I think that that's what, what I'd like, to, um, like us all to remember. So uh, I'll start with privacy, um, and, and on the intellectual privacy side, the concern here, um, and, there, and there, is, um, there is a suggestion here, a, 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 as we think about it, um, that, uh, that moving towards an automated system um, uh, should be abandoned uh, is, 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 has been uh, the claim of many. I don't think that's necessarily the case, um, but, but it is important, I, that's why I want to bring it first. Um, uh, the claim there is um, that uh, um, the way that these systems are run, and part of the, the market principle there is that um, in trying to uh, uh, automate the process and, and the way that uh, content is used, one of the greatest values is um, consumer behavior um, and the profiling of individual behavior. I think it's also mentioned um, as a uh, positive market development in, uh, in uh, um, uh, Garnett's paper. Um, 
On the one hand, this does uh, definitely uh, provide support. We can actually imagine a lower cost subscription model that's enabled by that kind of advertising, and that could be a positive development. But in terms of um, intellectual privacy, um, the, uh, uh, the implications of that are actually quite profound. Um, I would actually call it, um, in addition to sort of intellectual privacy, just to give a picture, hopefully not too vivid, but um, intellectual nudity. Um, I think that um, as we, uh, you know, if, if, you, if, you go, if you go back and you look at your search terms or you sort of, if you were to chronicle the way that you went about uh, uh, maneuvering around your digital objects, um, you'd find that it reveals a great deal about yourself. Um, just one thing, I'm sure we've all done it. Um, if you just, you know, take a look at the number of times you've searched for your own name or, 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 or done something of the sort, I think we'd all, um, we'd all be, uh, uh, or, you know, a little bit um, uh, 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 surprised by the extent of that. But it's not just um, it's not just minor things like that. But there's actually um, a lot of different ways in which we engage with uh, with a world that is much more revealing when we're uh, between us and our computer um, than anything that we do really in public. Um, and so the expectation of privacy um, is now uh, something that um, you know implicates the mind. Uh, and not just our uh, user behavior outside. So um, uh, the kinds of things um, that one searches for, engages with, if chronicled and profiled and placed together has implications uh, both for uh, things that lie outside of mainstream uh, interests. Um, those people who are searching for uh, or, or using information um, uh, that identifies them um, through those kinds of interactions as being um, uh, part of some minority. Um, we can imagine the extent to which that, uh, that can have implications politically. Um, for example, uh, 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 in some societies, um, uh, there's uh, legal implications to, um, and, and social implications um, to one's uh, uh, sexual orientation. And I think uh, the way that one searches and, and, and uses, uses information may reveal that, and that's something that, um, uh, in particular, at moments of, uh, of, 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 of tense social um, uh, processing, that it, 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 it's something that, that we might, might want to um, consider. Um, the relationship between art and politics, we're talking about art um, and content, but, uh, but that's also uh, very revealing I mean, um, in the way that we, we engage in that. Um, I think some of us, as we're processing what's taking place, uh, here in India, um, I've, I've, I've searched for things that I hope I wouldn't um, would place me on the wrong side of things. I've I've, I've been interested in um, in issues of terrorism and and how that's uh, come about and some of the information about that. I, I I I don't know if someone on the other end, if there was a computer processing it, um, would be able to distinguish me from someone with malicious intent uh, based on some of the things that I've tried to engage with and 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 uh, and, and 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 interacted with. So that's on the, um, the, intellectual uh, the intellectual privacy side. The, we have actually an indication of a possibility of, of uh, rather than abandonment, which I'm actually trying to distinguish myself from. Um, I think there's a, a, um, a suggestion of how um, this can be done that actually is um, um, not, 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 not exactly um, anonymous, but pseudonymous or, um, or actually engages people within the context of roles rather than um, personally, identifi personally identifiable. Um, there's one, uh, the, Feder the Federated Digital Rights Management that's uh, a project, I think from the University of Tennessee, um, sees people in roles and so um, actually wouldn't be personally identifiable the way you use, it, you use information on the user side. Um, it would be, you know, if I am uh, library user X or I am uh, Professor Y or I am a um, uh, private citizen entering um, Z, um, I have different permissions and it doesn't identify me as a person and still is able to manage my uses. Um, this, can, uh, uh, this can also actually work with, um, with uh, consumer behavior um, in an aggregated sense and so there could still be market value. Um, we, heard, uh, we heard from Caroline actually um, a distinguishing between uh, between person um, and uh, and type, uh, uh, and so uh, on on the, on the creator side, 
and one can imagine that the same thing can actually uh, happen on the user side. The problem is, is there's, there's a market failure for privacy preferences, um, as we've seen over, over the years, that, that, uh, that um, uh, people talk a lot about privacy, but don't, um, but don't um, pay for it. Um, and, so, uh, and so we need, actually, uh, uh, the role of public servants to promote that. Um, so, um, I think that uh, there, there are several concepts, and I, I think uh, in order to um, move on to the second theme of the asymmetry in control over uses, um, I'll just suggest that people uh, read uh, some of the work of Julie Cohen, um, who's thought about this in, uh, in a very deep way um, in uh, several articles, including um, DRM and privacy very explicitly, but a whole series of papers um, that has thought about um, the uh, implications for privacy and autonomy, uh, the right to read uh, anonymously, um, the way that intellectual consumption is actually underrepresented um, in, uh, in our notions of, uh, of, of, uh, of privacy and intellectual freedom. Um, the other aspect of what I, what I want to talk about um, from, from is, is um, consumer uses, um, not in regards to privacy, but in regards to uh, the traditional scope of copyright, which is um, the way that things uh, not only are disseminated, but the way that they're used. And um, copyright law is intended to, uh, to regulate that, um, in a sense, and um, is intended to actually strike a balance between uh, the, the uh, production of uh, incentives for the production of creative and innovative work, um, but also uh, to ensure the uh, dissemination and the uh, public purposes uh, by which people use works um, to enable there to be enough uh, wiggle room, flexibility, um, for people to be able to engage with work um, in, order to, uh, in order to create more work or in order to learn or in order to um, to have access in other ways, um, as, uh, as, as WIPO is most definitely exploring right now. Um, and it's, it's actually a very exciting time for that reason um, to be thinking about these things. Um, but, uh, but we return to uh, the fact that all these things are done in an automated way. And uh, an observation that, that, uh, that I've thought about for, for a while, and I was very happy to hear um, in... Uh, in uh, uh, Nick Garnett's presentation uh, at WIPO uh, at the SACR, um, an observation about the, the fact that, uh, I don't know, if I might be paraphrasing, but that um, uh, computers uh, as a matter of, um, as a matter of uh, epistemology actually, uh, uh, are not able to judge. This is something that, uh, that, uh, that in artificial intelligence, we, we uh, um, philosophers of AI have, have, have actually understood that um, there's all sorts of things um, in the Turing test in the Chinese room experiment um, for those who know it as an example, um, uh, are, are able to process instructions but actually not able to make judgments about. This is the example of the computer disk being put into the, to the judge to process a result. Um, there's actually a lack of a human element. And so my comments in this section are, um, are to try to introduce that human element to sort of suggest what the problems are with um, the lack of the human element and to suggest um, one very particular um, uh, proposal that's been, um, that's been developed uh, uh, on uh, the reverse takedown and notice um, uh, that would be uh, useful to connect with these ideas um, in reintroducing the human element. And so before we go on um, in, in exploring that uh, as, as, as a um, uh, sort of theoretical suggestion, um, it's important to recognize that there are limits um, and exceptions and limitations um, to copyright. There are sorts of uses uh, that are, uh, that don't have to be paid for. Um, there are uh, all sorts of uses um, that, uh, that um, uh, are permissible uh, but need to be paid for in a collective way and actually this kind of automated system would benefit that and would, uh, would actually um, be a, a, a positive direction, um, would enable that in, in some ways. Uh, there's also um, a judicially developed notion of 
copyright misuse. I saw in one of the presentations that, w that was at the September 2000 meeting, um, it was praise that one of these systems can last for like 200 years, um, which just happens to be outside the scope of copyright. And there was a case in the um, late 80s, the laser comb case that actually uh, uh, developed the copyright misuse doctrine precisely on that uh, exact problem of a 99 year um, uh, 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 license um, on, on uses that exceeded um, uh, and, and, and was therefore struck down. Um, the, um, the copyright infringement was, um, uh, the defense of copyright misuse was brought against, um, was brought to defend against the copyright, uh, the copyright infringement claim and, um, and uh, uh, the, the defendant won actually in that case. Um, and so we've actually got um, uh, something to think about within this context is the way in which rights, rights management information and the way that the technologists develop it uh, that would be inconsistent with the public policy of copyright and therefore copyright misuse principles should be considered. Um, I think also, uh, what, you know, one measure that people often use in terms of uh, uses, I'm, I'm still on uses, um, is uh, the way the normal user would engage with, with, with information. I actually think uh, a lot more interesting and important way to think about is how artists use information, actually. If you sort of think that way, um, you see all sorts of ways in which uh, uses of content and information um, uh, in its experimental sense um, uh, should be a flexible area. Um, so there's all sorts of ways in which an artist, two minutes, okay, there are all sorts of ways in which artists um, use information, experiment with it um, before publishing it, before releasing it to the world. They do it in the privacy of their own home um, that, uh, uh, or studio that um, uh, wouldn't actually be, uh, uh, you know, counted in terms of, um, in terms of uses and, and how that should be um, remunerated. Um, that would be accounted for with such a, um, a, a persistent system of monitoring uses um, and, 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 would, and would not allow for that experimental space. So given the fact that there are all sorts of uses that, that, that do and ought to lie outside of, um, of uh, uh, monitoring and, um, and of uh, licensing even and of, of remuneration, um, this, uh, the, the, the idea that um, the user should be able to express what they um, would like to do with the information um, should be available. So the uh, suggestion of the reverse takedown um, and notice, um, which is developed in a paper by uh, 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 Pam Samuelson, uh, Jerry Reichman, and several others um, recently, um, suggests that uh, uh, as the, as the law has developed, and we've seen cases on both sides, those cases where the uh, court has seen that the, um, that the non-infringing uses were actually too minor and, has dis and have decided um, that the primary use being uh, used for infringement of technologies um, dominate and therefore should be, um, sh and therefore that technology uh, should be either um, uh, removed from market or um, should be, uh, there should be some remedy of compensation for the infringement that, um, that these cause. Um, there's also those cases where there's been um, uh, uh, overstretching um, on the use of technology. Those cases like the, the Lexmark case and um, in cases where people are using um, technological tools to exceed um, the rights granted by copyright. Um, there's a middle, and so um, and, uh, as, we, as, we, as we've seen, and, and rather than see the way the law is in regards to automated rights management as static from 10, 15 years ago, we actually see that the law has developed a great deal, and we can allow for, especially in this context where we've moved away from the binary, uh, we're no longer at the zero and one. We're actually now, very interestingly, um, in these set of presentations, all of them, we've moved to a greater subtlety um, and greater uh, uh, um, ability to create nuance. Um, we should actually uh, consider uh, where the user fits in and the user to express um, what their uses ought to be. So if you have a particular use, um, you should be able to, and the systems should be developed, the technology should be created in such a way that you can express that. You should be able to ask, 
Um, I would like to use it for this legitimate purpose, which is uh, enshrined in law, and I would like to have permission to do that and therefore uh, lie outside of, of the possible um, infringement claim. Um, again, uh, there's a market failure there, uh, and so that's why we need uh, good public servants uh, to help us get there. Um, uh, um, uh, finally, uh, and this is a side note, but, um, but in the creation of metadata, um, I, I, I do want to point out um, that there's a concern about the ownership of metadata. So this is um, for those kind of, uh, uh, you know, there, there are meta issues in the metadata and of, of meta intellectual property. So the story of Grace Note is one where um, the uh, ID3 information was generated by users actually. Um, the users typed in all of the uh, information about songs. And then the company that bought CDDB uh, privatized that information as Grace Note and, um, and, uh, um, and then uh, to control that, and then there's licensing of the metadata in the use every time your iTunes looks up that information, there's, there's, a, there's a transaction there. Now, um, I'm not sure what the, uh, uh, what the public policy proposal should be, whether metadata should, should be in the public domain. I think there's a concern, and there's uh, 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 Nick Garnett uh, uh, said specifically um, that, uh, that we see that, there's, that there is a problem in terms of the interoperability of these different standards. And so I think there is most definitely a role for, um, for, for WIPO to lead the way in, um, in, in thinking about and understanding how we can have this layer of, uh, of, of manipulation of digital information be useful. Um, and that's something that's, that's crucial for this to work. Um, because um, to, to sort of end up, there's, there's a lot of possibility here. Um, uh, I hope that I've conveyed even in uh, concerns about intellectual privacy, which are real, um, and important and ought to be considered that this uh, these projects shouldn't shouldn't necessarily be abandoned um, this is not a this is not a shrill uh, uh, concern this is one of um, of uh, if, if we're going to build it um, let's build it um, with uh, with the user side in mind as much and unfortunately rather than the rather than um, uh, uh, the market actors having um, a say as as they would as the incentives sort of dictate um, we actually need um, a sort of a public voice here, uh, and uh, and legislators and decision makers to help uh, the user side be represented and uh, be present in this automated system. So um, we don't have to have sort of the max headroom result of uh, of citizens who are ones and citizens who are zeros. Um, we can actually have uh, automated systems in which the world's knowledge is not only available but also um, searchable and indexable, um, but uh, but for it to be done uh, fairly and uh, equitably and with uh, with greater possibilities, not only for those who um, who are the uh, incumbent creators of information, but the future uh, creators um, of, of of the people generally and the consumers. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ed. I know that there. Uh, some people who want to make observations, and um, we've got another session starting in here in, in um, shortly. But I think we will go to the audience for for immediate questions. And I know that François um, Pellegrini wanted to uh, to make some comments. So could we have a microphone to the gentleman raising his hand, please? I would like to make a, a comment. I hope it won't be too long, but I, I want to stress a, um, a, a point: is that you cannot have the butter and the money for the butter, and the problem with digital identifiers as uh, discussed here and which are very necessary is the point that in fact people uh, following the WIPO uh, treaties have mixed um, DRMs and TPMs and so they wanted both the identification and to prevent the users from accessing content and so uh, the WIPO treaties sanctuarized uh, the, the DRM systems to say, okay, this identification data is necessary, so we should not remove them if we want to remunerate creators and uh, right holders properly. But on the same time, they made a semantic shift and said, no, it's TPMs, production measures, which should be protected and not being circumvented. And TPMs are a complete failure. I'm a technician, I'm an engineer, I'm a, I'm a computer science researcher. And for instance, when you look at CSS, 
the, the system for the content scrambling system for DVDs, it has nothing to do with anti-copying because if you are an industry uh, pirate, you take a CSS scramble DVD, there is a zero, you put a zero, there is a one, you put a one, and you have a copy, a digital copy of your CSS scrambled uh, uh, DVD, which you can sell on the markets everywhere in the world. So CSS has nothing to do with protecting against copying. It just enables, and when people wanted to exercise their right to flipping the pages of the book, just to go to the right page they want, for instance, with the Jon Johansson case in Europe, he had to crack the CSS and do the DCSS to be able to r access his content under a Linux platform without having to buy a Windows operating system and a, and, and a DVD uh, playing software. So the point is that um, the content industry has wanted the butter and the money of the butter and wanted to have a pay-per-view system and lock users. And as, 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 as uh, has been said, a machine cannot judge. So when there are exceptions, the machine said there are no exceptions because I assume you are guilty. And if you want to copy my data, I assume it's uh, illegal copying, not that you are exercising your right to uh, uh, private copying, for instance. And it's the same with the st three strikes approach and the, the, the fingerprinting system, like uh, the ones of Audible Magic and so. There has been a recent uh, ruling in Belgium which says that this system does not work B and, and you cannot sue an ISP because he, he, he tried to use the system and it doesn't work. It Technically, I can, I, can, I can prove it. I mean, this will never work because any time people who want to share data will resort to encrypted communication systems. And so doing fingerprinting on the networks and trying to find if, so if someone is judged guilty or not just on the flow of data circulating on the network, it's, it's, intellectu it's nonsense, it's mathematical nonsense. So this approach is going to fail anyway. So if you consider that the copyright system is due to remunerate the, uh, the, the, the artists, then you should, on the opposite, monitor the traffic on the internet and use some sort of, uh, of li global remuneration to pay and to give uh, the money back to the authors considering that uh, identification data. And so you have what is called a global license, but it's the only proven way to give the money to the creators because if you say there is identification data and for, the, for material which circulates over the internet, this data will be used to track down people who share and do file sharing. Then people will protect from this identification and we will lose the benefit <coughs> of the identification to remunerate the creators. And so um, the last point uh, I want to make uh, regarding this is that th the three strikes approach is a dead end. This is a dead end. And all of this legislation has been put forward by the major content creators. But why? It's because these people feel that their existence is endangered by the internet because the internet connects directly the artists to their public. In the area of the material age, you needed th those large companies to, to print the CDs, the DVDs, and ship them around the world. But no, th this is no longer necessary. And they, they, they are paid highly for that. On a, on a one euro song, only seven cents of euro, seven percent are given to the artist. The other goes to the editor. And people know that. And when you download a song on iTunes, it's only one dollar per song, but only five cents to the artist. And it is nonsense because there is nothing to pay for. I mean, most users see that as parasitism and don't, w don't want to enter this system. So there, there is a paradigm shift. Clearly, the zero copy cost of the digital age enables new economic models and will make old uh, economic uh, leaders disappear unless they adapt. But clearly, there will be a downsizing of the major content creation companies because user-generated content is growing and growing. And we must find a way to remunerate also these uh, user -generated, uh, this user-generated content through identifiers. So indeed, there must be a global system so that people can, with very minimal fee or, or even gratis, register to have a unique author ID number. 
There must be a system which allows to aggregate the contributions because no people create material by aggregating materials from others. So there should be simple systems um, such that a creator, for instance, a, a rap a music maker says, okay, I took pieces from this author, this author, this author, and I mixed them, well, I assume the proportion is 20% for him, 20%, so that there can be some credits given. And this system must be public and open source. The problem when I hear about interoperable MTPs, I'm laughing because when you ask these people, well, but what about open source implementations of these MTPs? The guy says, but that's not possible because if we give the source code, then it's no longer secure. And so the problem is that you cannot prevent people from exercising their freedoms. We have no the ability to share culture. So find a global way, address, instead of going to the dead end of a uh, paper act thing, and, and you said that, but, but, you, also, but you, you are still bind by say, uh, bound uh, by saying, okay, but uh, it's a global access to a local catalog. No, let's do global access. Let's think that globally. Get rid of TPMs, that's nonsense. It, has no, it, it doesn't work, it's, it's, it's impossible. Three strikes approach, it's complete bullshit. So sorry for the term, but it's, it's really what I feel like that. And imaginate how to use identifiers to remunerate creation at the global level, and that would be a better world. Thank you, Francois. Let's the sides. So I want to ask two specific questions. One, as my predecessor told, that the TPM is, is absolutely ridiculous things, and there's a loophole. Possibly because TPM, exactly what is mean by TPM, is not defined in the, the WCTR WPT. So, is it possible to have a precise definition of TPM? Was what exactly mean by TPM in the WCTR WPT and WPPT? And if so, what is the difficulty to introduce that kind of precise definition? That is my first question. Now, second question is that: Do you feel that there is a need for and how? introducing a mechanism that the objectively priced access to uh, objectively priced access to ensure that the copyright holder doesn't charge to the user in a just reasonable fair and just manner so if so what kind of mechanism there should be uh, i actually have uh, very little to add after what francois said uh, but I, I just, uh, my comments are specifically uh, targeted at uh, Mr. Garnett and Mr. Katz. Now, uh, use has, has historically never been, uh, never been enforced automatically. Now, technology increases the range, ranges and, and ease of uses that, use, uh, that people can put it to. And, uh, and I guess that's what, uh, what necessitates or, or that's what uh, creates this knee-jerk reaction from, from content owners. I, I actually would like to, to get away from this binary of the content owners and the users because we, d we all realize that, that that binary no longer holds true, especially given the, the, uh, uh, the ease at, uh, of, of content creation thanks to technology. Now, uh, I think that reaction is, is problematic. Now, uh, as, as uh, uh, Edan pointed out, uh, things like fair use cannot be automated. Okay, various uh, now Google in in its uh, in its YouTube response to to the uh, uh, to the McCain campaign. Okay, it said how it, even they with their you know <laughs> roomfuls of of lawyers and and the the smartest lawyers at, at that uh, are, won't be able to judge on fair use uh, in, in a way because the judiciary actually and this is throughout true throughout the world. Okay. Uh, keeps to itself, reserves to itself the flexibility of, of judging on fair use. Now, now even human intervention, okay, isn't really an, an answer there. So it's, it's just a, it's, it's just a, a shared judgment. It's, it's not even, even individual humans can't really make fair judgments on, on things like fair use because the, the judiciary reserves to itself that, right? So I don't see how technology, which is automated, can do that. Now, uh, I think, uh, and, and the, the basic problem that I see is that automated content identification can be really helpful, can be really good. However, on the other hand, uh, and, and Mr. Garnett, you, uh, you didn't address, uh, you addressed uh, ACI in, at a, uh, in much more detail than, than you did TPMs. I find TPMs the much bigger problem because, uh, uh, because 
I see TPMs as a way of uh, enforcing business models. I have no problems with TPMs per se. I only have problems with them when they get legal backing. Now, uh, what, I, what I now this, uh, now I, I think TPMs are, are fine as long as I uh, am not uh, as long as I have alternatives outside of those TPMs, uh, which I can enforce without fear of being being sued or without uh, there being any legal sanctions on me because of that. Now, uh, I, I'm sorry, you're going to have to close okay, up. Uh, uh, ju ju just, we're just, have to just to room. wrap up one, one final uh, this thing, one small point. Uh, I, I didn't at all understand Mr. Cat. I appreciate Mr. Katz's uh, 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 attempt at a nuanced understanding, but I didn't understand it. I don't see how a middle path is is really possible uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to TPMs. A lot of very important points there. Um, I don't have the benefit of being an engineer. Um, but I have had the privilege of working with engineers for a long time. And yeah, whatever one engineer develops, another engineer will always say doesn't work. Um, there are serious issues which I've touched on and actually deal with in more detail. Um, like Francois, I don't believe in the three-step approach either. I think that the content industry is making a profound error in promoting that kind of approach and uh, should pull back from that. Um, coming on to the, um, the gentleman from the customs, um, I'm not sure that you can define TPMs in, in, in a way that would be particularly useful. I think we recognize them um, and they are referenced for particular purposes, both at the international level. Please let me finish, because we're very limited in time here. Um, and in national laws. And attempts to define technology often end up being beached on the, you know, the sandbanks of time. Coming back to your second question, which I think is a very important one, which is, is there some mechanism for independent price controls in a situation where we're moving more to blanket licensing for the basic delivery of content? I think that is a very interesting question because traditionally, there have been mechanisms where blanket licensing approaches are used for addressing this issue of pricing. And the question, I don't have an answer today, but I do think it's an issue that will come around more and more where content is licensed on a blanket basis uh, in terms of basic distribution that we will have to look at. Um, and then the last point, dealing with TPMs, well, I didn't deal with them specifically my presentation. I've dealt with them elsewhere. I didn't deal with them here because it wasn't the subject matter of the, of, of the meeting. But um, having worked at a TPM company, having listened to the um, ambitions of the developers of digital rights management at Intertrust and seeing how it's played out, I have a fairly realistic view of what the pros and cons of TPM systems are and the limitations. And I think one, I'll just leave you with what I consider to be the huge irony in this space is that DRM for music was actually forced into decline by Apple using DRM for music in its iTunes and uh, iPod fair play um, structure. So I think there's an irony there that we can reflect on. Very briefly, Edin, because our next session is uh, our panelists are ready to start. Yeah, I'll just uh, say one sentence. Um, uh, thanks very much for those comments. Uh, also on TPM, I, uh, I wasn't uh, actually suggesting that there's much nuance in TPMs. Uh, uh, we were talking about the automated rights management, and I think that there's space there. I think that um, there's leadership being shown by WIPO, and I think there's a, an opportunity for the consumer voice to be heard at this moment, and that's what I was trying to address in suggesting nuance. On TPMs, I think the best thing we could do is to, as a matter of public policy, um, allow for more flexible turning off or disabling of TPMs. Um, so that's uh, my, my opinion about that. The, the, the nuance here is to, um, in this automated system, introduce the human and consider the public interest and user choices. You have thir one second, Carol. I happen to believe that communication is particularly important and talking about different perspectives. And I think the only solutions that we can reach are ones that we reach together. In terms of identifying the fair use and what shouldn't be paid for, I come from a licensing context. I don't get paid unless I sell a copyright license to a user. 
And if you start from a premise that people are prepared to pay for what they should pay for, then you can start looking at proxies for fair use. What we do in Australia, for, in, a, in a schools context, is we say, okay, let's do a study. 25% of the stuff you're using is fair use or pre-licensed, so we'll only charge you 75%. There are ways and means of getting there in a pragmatic way. Thanks very much. Thanks to everybody, and uh, thanks for your interest. <laughs>